Well, we've talked a bit about the background of these first two letters, First and Second Timothy. We want to continue with that now. We've explained a little bit about who Paul is, who Timothy is, what kind of relationship they had, uh, why it was so great that they, God put them together. But I want to talk to you now for the next few minutes about the city of Ephesus. And you say, Ephesus, I'm, why is that significant? Why do we need to talk about that? This is the city in which Paul spent between two and a half and three years. Uh, as far as I know, this is the place where Paul spent the most time of any city where he served. So he had invested a lot of time in the people of this city. Um, this is then the city that Paul left Timothy in. And we'll talk and see in the scriptures of what Timothy's reaction was when Paul left him there. He was not happy. He was tearful. Uh, I can't even imagine when Paul left Timothy what that departure was like, how hard that must have been for him. But I want to spend the next few minutes telling you about the city. Uh, if, if we could go back in time, I wish I could take all of you there with me to see it because it must have been an amazing place. It was a relatively wealthy city. It was a very cosmopolitan city. There was a lot of commerce. There was a lot of trade. Uh, people were coming in and out of the city on various travel routes. So it was a lot of activity. They said at the time when this letter was written, there was about 200,000 people there. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute, because now we have lots and lots of cities that have more than 200,000 people. Kursk has far more than 200,000 people. But in the first century, this is a huge city. This is a very large city. So if you're looking for a place to start a, a Christian work and the church, and not just one church, but many churches, this is an incredible place to invest time. And I imagine that that's why Paul invested so much time here. One of the reasons that this city is significant is that it had, if you remember studying this as we did in our, I don't know, in our grade school years, uh, one of the seven wonders of the world is in this city, or it was in the city. It was the temple to the goddess Artemis or Diana, two names for the same thing. Amazing piece of architecture, marble columns, marble floors, just this incredible piece of architecture and all that went along with it, that there were some cults of prostitution and fertility that kind of went along with that, that tied into who this goddess was. So what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some scriptures in a minute about how um, important the, um, the idol trade was when they would create images of Diana for their homes. And when the gospel came and what that did to diminish their ability to make money by making these idols was incredible. But you need to understand that about this city. It was just an amazing city. One of the other things that intrigued me is that it had an enormous amphitheater. An amphitheater is this, um, that has a, a round shape, a diameter, and they said it held 24,000 people. And again, in, in our culture, in the United States, we have arenas, sporting arenas, concert arenas that will hold 20,000 people and say, ah, that's no big deal. But again, first century, carving out of rock these stone steps and these stone seats in the side of this hill, 24,000 people, such, and they didn't have amplification systems. But because of the acoustics and in this place to stand on that stage and 24,000 people around you and to be able to do these dramatic productions or these symposiums or these speeches must have been incredible. And they found the ruins to these places. And some of them are still in some parts still intact. Um, uh, 500 feet across is what the dimensions of this place is. You can translate that into meters for yourself. But it's an amazing architectural achievement. You can imagine all the things that were happening in this city at this time. So again, if you want to find a strategic place for the gospel and for the church to be built at this particular time, this is an incredible place to do that. As I said, it's a place of uh, very much wealth of upper middle class people there, also a place of great poverty, uh, but it enjoyed a, a certain measure of success for a number of centuries, and then it began to diminish, and they, they lived in a place where there was a bay, a waterway, that came right to the city, but over the years it began to get silted in, and I'm told that today the city of Ephesus is now seven miles from the Aegean Sea. And so when that began to happen, commerce was less, and so obviously the water traffic was less, but again, you want to think of a time when the city was thriving. And when you would mention the city, oh, I'm going to Ephesus for the next month. They go, oh, really? 
wow, when you're there, make sure that you see this, or make, when you're there, you make sure that you see that. So that's the city, and that's the place in which Timothy is going to serve, in which Paul has spent, invested this amount of time. Now, what I'd like to do next is show you the different places in the book of Acts, especially, where Paul and or Timothy were in this city, and the things that happened there. As I said, Paul passed through there. He wasn't there on his first journey. He wasn't there on his second journey, or he was there briefly on his second journey, I'm sorry. And then it was on his third journey where he spent the majority of time that he was going to spend there. But the first place that I want to take you is to the book of Acts, chapter 18. So if you'd find in your Bibles the book of Acts and turn to chapter 18. Beginning with verse 18, and I'll, I'll just read a few verses. You could read from Acts chapter 18, verse 18, on through chapter 20, because that's where the intersection in, in, in terms of the city happened. But I just want to read Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 23, and you begin to get a little bit of the flavor of what's happening here. So this is what it says, Acts chapter 18, verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Centre he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, so this is the mention of the city, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Remember how I said he likes to debate? He likes to get into a dialogue? That's exactly what he did when he went to the synagogue. Verse 20. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. So on this second missionary journey, he's just there a brief time. He has enough dialogue to get them intrigued about the gospel and about who Jesus Christ was. But he says, I've got to be going right now, but I'm hoping to come back and spend time with you again. And so he continues on with his travels. The second journey ends, and it's time for the third journey. So when we find that the story picking itself up again, still in the book of Acts chapter 18, is part of his return journey. So if you drop down to verse 24, it says this, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Okay, again, our city, this very cosmopolitan place. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, remember, they were associates of Paul, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. So this isn't about Paul, but this is already one of the residual works of Paul's work by leaving Priscilla and Aquila there. So they meet this man named Apollos. His teaching is not quite accurate yet. They straighten him out, and he's ready to go on. Let's continue with chapter 19. So we're now on Paul's third journey, and he's going to come back to Ephesus. And amazing things happen in this long section. Chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. So he's back. He said, I'd like to come back. I hope to come back. And now he is here. There he found some disciples, some followers of Christ. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? Hey, have you received the Holy Spirit? Who's the Holy Spirit? Boy, does he have something to teach them, doesn't he? Verse 3, and he said, into what then were you baptized? Because they'd been baptized, and they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying, there were about 12 men in all. This is in Ephesus. Continue. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So you can imagine this dialogue. So he's arguing back and forth. 
Let me tell you who Jesus was. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Let me tell you what Jesus said about the kingdom of God. And for three months, can you imagine every day getting up in the morning and saying, Hey, Paul, what are you going to do today? Oh, I'm going back to the synagogue. Paul, don't you want to do something else? No, that's where all the action is. That's where I want to be. So Paul's back at the synagogue, and it says in verse 8, He entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now just think about that for a minute. So we've told you, that this is the reason I told you why you need to understand a little bit about Ephesus. When a city is this center of commerce and trade, that means people are coming in, they're passing through, they're buying, they're selling, they're, they're participating in conversation. So all these people not only live there, but all the people who are passing through, they're beginning to encounter this. And what Paul says at the end of this, well, he was in three months in one, one place, and then he was in this hall for two years. By the end of that time, all the residents, not just of Ephesus, but of Asia, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Can you imagine that? In two years and three months, everybody, not just in that city, but in the whole region, had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine being a part of a movement like that? I serve in a church in a town. And we, we have a, a network of churches that participate with us, two little churches in two rural towns. We have a video opportunity. that The churches are too poor to hire a full-time pastor. So we said, you know what? We'll record Pastor Bruce's sermons on video, and then we'll send you the sermons, and then you can afford to keep your churches open. And these, one church is about 50 miles away from us, and the other church is about 60 miles away from us. So every week, they watch my sermons on videotape. And so we're increasing the reach of our particular church a few miles in two other churches. What Paul is saying here is that in two years and three months, everyone in that entire region had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's so significant. The reason I stop and ha have you paused, when God chooses to use someone like the apostle Paul says, Paul, <laughs> You were zealous for my law and, and for the Jewish system and the Jewish structure. He says, but now I'm going to take you to the Gentiles. I'm going to take you to the world in ways that you can't even imagine. You think that when Paul sat down at the end of his life and, and looked at all the ways that God had used him, he just, I think that inside of him, he just went, I can't even believe, God, what you did in my life. And some of you who are hearing this or some of you are watching this saying, you know, God can't use me like that. I, I'm just a student. I'm just a worker. I, I, I just make a few dollars for my family. God can't use me like that. You know what? Most likely God won't use you to reach a whole region, but God will use you in the way that he has planned in the place that he has placed you. I serve in a city of 7,000 people in a state which has very few people. I am doing what God has called me to do in that place, and God is calling you to serve wherever he has. And we don't measure ourselves by Paul, but what Paul does is he encourages us and says, if God can do that through Paul, I wonder what he can do through me. So let's continue with the story. We're in Acts chapter 19, verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them. And the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now, just think about that for a minute. So there's Jewish people there who said, that sounds kind of like fun. If he can get demons to come out of people, and we're good Jewish people, we're going to try it. So they would say, in the name of the Jesus that he proclaims, come out of them. How did that work? <laughs> Verse 14, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? 
And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Didn't work so well, did it? Just because they called on the same name of the Lord that Paul was using, they didn't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and it backfired on them, verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. That, that just makes me stop and go, you're amazing. When people try to do things in the name of a Jesus they don't know, and it doesn't work, God says, but I can use that for my good and my glory anyway. And these people got scared and they got afraid, and it says, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled, it was exalted, it was proclaimed. God is being worshipped. This is an amazing time in history. Verse 18, also many of those who are now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. See, this is one of the things Ephesus was known for, the magic arts, sorcery. When the gospel comes into an area and it changes people's lives, it changes them dramatically. These people said, we, we don't want that anymore. And they had these books of spells and formulas, and they said, it just it feels dirty to us. And can you imagine this great big huge bonfire in the middle of the city it's flames re reaching up to the sky, and a worship service is happening. Because these people no longer want to serve these magic arts and the dark spirits. We want to serve Yahweh. We want to serve the God that gave us Jesus Christ and the Savior of the world. Verse 19, we read verse 19, verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now it's all good news at this point. We're still in the city of Ephesus. Paul is there. He's spending these years with them. Look at where it turns bad. Verse 21 of chapter 19. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, look at this, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So he's going, It's about time for me to go. Timothy, Erastus, why don't you go on ahead of me? I'll join you in a short time. Look at what happened next, verse 23. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, remember we talked about this? One of the big trades in the city of Ephesus to, was to make idols, and they would make them out of silver. So here's a guy named Demetrius who makes these idols. Brought no little business to the craftsmen. So he's a big businessman. Verse 25, these he gathered together and the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people. Remember we had said in that verse that the gospel spread throughout Asia in that two and a half year period of time. Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. So there's a conflict. Hey, we worship Artemis. The, the, the whole world in Asia worships Artemis. And this Paul is coming in and he's introducing another God. We don't accept his God. And, and so if we don't do something, men, they're going to change sides and we're going to lose all of our business. We're not going to be able to make money anymore. Verse 28. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And, you, and it'd be like a chant. Great is Artemis. Great is Artemis. And so there's this riots beginning to happen. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater. Remember the theater? 24,000 seats. Dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. Hey, you guys are with Paul. We're going to take you. We're going to make a mockery out of you. We're going to take you to the theater so everybody can see what frauds you are. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. I love this. Paul says, I want to be in there. I want to go. And his followers said, Paul, you're going to get killed. You can't go in there. Paul says, I want to be where the action is. There might be a chance for me to tell the gospel. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. 
verse 31. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. So he wants to go. I want to go. I want to go. And they're saying, no, you can't. You're crazy. Verse 32. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. So can you picture this amphitheater? And I don't know if it was full, but let's say it was full. 24,000 people. And one guy leans over to the other guy and he goes, why are you here? And the guy goes, I don't know. Why are you here? Goes, well, somebody told me to come here. Well, they told me we're going to get something to eat. Well, somebody told me that there was going to be a speech. Well, somebody told me there was going to be this. These people, it's this all confusing. So we have followers of Artemis. We have new followers of God. And we have some people that go, I don't even know what's going on here. So we continue on with the story. Some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. Most of them did not know why uh, they had come together. Now, verse 33. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. So he goes, you know, when everybody's talking and it's confusing, the, the leader will get up, just sit down, sit down, sit down. I have something to say. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours. Here's a guy who's wanting to talk to them. So he stands up and he says, Sit down. Sit down. And one guy says to the other, He's a Jew. We're not going to listen to the Jew. And they start chanting and it goes, in America, in big, in big amphitheaters, and big, we have this thing called the wave. Do they do that here in Russia? People start putting up their hands, and you make this wave that goes around the arena, and, it's, and everybody cheers, and it goes around and around. Well, for two hours, they were in this amphitheater going, great is Artemis, great is Artemis, and just back and forth. I could do that for five minutes. I couldn't do that for two hours. So for two hours, this goes on. Verse 35, when the, when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. Now this is after two hours of shouting. For you have brought... These men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone and the courts are open and there are proconsuls, let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. What he's saying is, if we keep this up, and the Romans hear about this, we're going to be in trouble. He says, go home. And after two hours, they did. Now, into verse 20, just for a couple of verses. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. It was time to go. But again, I just marvel at Paul, who wanted to be in the center of the action. I, I want to be there. Can you imagine standing in front of 24,000 people and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? But God was saying, no, Paul, this is not your opportunity. You've done this work for the last two years, three months. Paul, they're, they're rioting. There's an uproar. They're going to send you right out of town. It's time for you to go. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. See now, why did I spend all of that time helping you see this story? Because we're digging a foundation, right? If you want to understand First and Second Timothy, you need to understand Paul, you need to understand Timothy, and you need to understand this city. 
What we've learned about this city is that they have this incredible passion for their goddess Artemis or, or Diana. They have this amazing temple and all that goes along with it socially and culturally and morally. And they say, we are going to, we are going to worship her. And this guy comes in with his new way and this new Christianity and this teachings about Jesus. And he said, so when it comes to 1 Timothy, and Paul is going to tell Timothy, Timothy, you've got to stay there. You've got to fight. These false teachings are coming in, and, and the people aren't going to believe everything that, you're, that I tried to say to them. Timothy, you have to stand your ground. You, you have to fight the battle that God has enabled you to fight with the strength that God gives you. So the reason I spend time on those stories is so that you can understand to a greater depth of what God was doing in that particular part of the world. The last time that we find out about the city of Ephesus in the Bible is in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. The only reason I'm even going to mention this to you is because something must have happened as the years go by. This place where Christianity was so vital and so rich and so electric and, and, and almost, and I, I was going to say the word defiant, but I don't mean it in that way, it's just strong. Something happened. See, Paul is sending Timothy to stay at Ephesus and to teach them because he's afraid of what's going to happen with the false teaching. I want you to see with me in the book of Revelation what ultimately happened, at least by the end of the first century, in that city. So Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. There are seven churches to whom letters are written, and the letter to the church in Ephesus is the first one. To the church in Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Let me read that with you. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. So he's writing to the church in Ephesus, probably right near the end of the first century. I know your works, your toil, your endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. That's good news. Timothy, you have to stay in Ephesus because false teachers are coming. They're teaching gospel twists, gospel corruptions. Please, Timothy, teach the truth. From what we see in these verses so far, they must have done a good job. You, you have rooted out you have found out and that they are not true, that they are false. Now, verse 3, I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. We, we take that to mean its authority or God's use of them from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He goes, guys, you are doing a great work. Thank you. God be praised. But you lost the heart part of it. You lost the love part of it. You know, and theologians uh, debate about what exactly this losing this love means. This is my personal illustration of it. I love serving the Lord in the church in which he has called me to. I really do. We have a, a marvelous church, a wonderful church. But sometimes I don't just have two things to do. I don't have five things to do. I have 15 things to do. At least that's the way it feels. And there are some times where I just say, I need to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I tend to forget about the people that I've been called to serve. And I lose that heart and I lose that passion for the person. And I do it as a task. And not because of the heart of the, uh, of the love of Jesus Christ in me. And I'm not sure if that's exactly what in the end, this is what they're talking about. But at least it has some relevance to that. Is, and, and I would encourage all of you who serve. Maybe you teach a Sunday school class. Maybe you are preachers in a church. Maybe you're just learning about the word of God. 
it's not enough just to know the truth. Jesus once said, you'll know the truth and it'll set you free. But not just intellectually, in your heart. In the Bible, the heart is symbolic for the very center of our being. And I think what we're going to learn from, from Paul to Timothy and about the churches in Ephesus is we can work hard, but we must never lose sight of the love and the passion of Jesus Christ that he has for his church. So if that becomes part of the flavor and part of the message that we're going to learn about 1 Timothy, I think that just gives us such a deep and rich foundation upon which to build. And we're almost there. We're almost ready to start our actual study of 1 Timothy, but we're going to take a short break, come back together, tie up a couple of loose ends, and then we're going to dive into the actual book itself. So let's take a short break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com. 